Hello everyone, I am Laura McLaughlin. As Janelle just said, I'm with Bricksmore Property Group and I'm the Director of Specialty Leasing. Um, just a couple of seconds about myself and my experience in Bricksmore. Bricksmore owns over 350 shopping centers in the US, we're in 34 states. All your major um, MSAs were pretty much up and down the East Coast. Uh, through the Sun Belt over to California. We've had the lovely pleasure of working with Barry and popupshops.io. Um, Janelle shared already, Barry and I have taken this uh, little slideshow presentation on the road and we are so thrilled to be here and are very thankful that Janelle asked us to be a part of this. We hope we can share with you what we like to call the recipe for your pop-up and the ingredients. So I'm um, gonna pass along to Barry so he can introduce himself. Okay, one, one thing uh, Laura didn't say, okay, is that she is the first lady of Haddon Heights, New Jersey. Her husband is the mayor. So we have royalty with us uh, this morning. Oh, you're too kind. I, I do. I love to wear many hats, which is why pop-up shops and temp leasing is where I love to be. I love it. I love it. Well, my name is uh, Barry Goldware, and I'm a retailer as uh Ron was talking about, I know the community. Uh, I've been a retailer my, my whole life. My claim to fame, I guess, if you call it, is I founded a chain of retail stores called Sun and Ski Sports. And uh, I, I'm an entrepreneur, so I built them up uh, to 31 stores in, in 13 states and was uh, fortunate enough to be able to sell my company eight years ago. Um, however, with Sun and Ski, we did all kinds of pop-ups. Um, back then, when I first got started, we didn't call them pop-ups. Um, we called them temporary stores. Um, and, and by the way, I, I, I'm all excited when we go to conferences and so forth. And I always like to meet the people that coin terms, okay? So the new term for the temporary store is called a pop-up or pop-up shop. And guess what? The gentleman that coined the term pop-up, Stephen Brooks, is actually speaking a little later this afternoon. So you got to stay tuned to hear this guy. Full um, circle, but, full circle. And um, very, very, very exciting. Uh, um, but anyway, we did a lot of pop-ups. And um, um, I can tell you that when I was doing the pop-ups, I, I it was tough. I mean, it was tough trying to find the right spaces. And uh, when we did find a space, it was hard to get an appointment with the, with the decision maker. And then once we got an appointment with the decision maker, I would give them my spiel about Sun and Ski and how cool we are. And before I, the words could roll, roll off my lips, I would get the response, Barry, Barry, we love Sun and Ski. If you want to sign a five or a 10 year lease, we're happy to do it, but we don't do temporaries. We don't do pop-ups. And so I wasted all that time. And so fast forward, I sell my company. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm looking to start a new company. And I see that the word uh, temporary stores have fashioned into pop-ups, uh, thanks to Stephen. And um, I, I, I realized that um, they are more popular than ever. That in many cases, because what's going on in retail today, pop-ups, many people say, are the new retail. And, and so I, I, again, reflected back on my days trying to do pop-ups and said, you know what the world needs, what the pop-up world needs is a website, a, a match.com, if you will that matches brands that specifically want to do pop-ups um, with spaces that again want to do specific pop-ups and and in one place on a website be able to go on see a picture of the space see the demographics of the center see a site plan get all the various information and then have a direct relationship a direct message to the decision maker and so it was uh, on that theory we founded uh, my partner and I, Scott Blair, founded popupshops.io. And it, that's exactly uh, what we do, is have the ability for you as a brand, or if there's any spaces out there, same for you, to go on in one place um, on the internet, 24 seven, be able to find spaces or brands that are um, definitely available to do pop-ups. And so that's basically uh, how, we got, how we got started. So anyway. And That's don't, my story and I'm sticking to it. Don't forget, Barry, you coined our own phrase. We're not just going to pop up. We're going to pop in. 
So right, right, right. So I coined one, but it's, it's not quite as good as pop out, though. I know, I know. We're, we'll keep working on that. Okay, we'll get all right, our good. Creativity going. So great. Well, let me just share my screen here for everyone, so we can click through some of our highlights, and we'll talk you through how to make a pop up pop. Hope everyone can see my screen now. Barry, you want to give me a yes? So uh, yes. All right, great. So you're the only one I can hear. Oh. <laughs> We're not interactive great like we normally are. This yeah, is great the, looking screen, Lord. So, you know, I want to maybe just broaden everyone here. And the education, pop up shops is the retail renaissance. And guys, what am I talking about? It. It's not just seasonality, it's not just holiday, it's not just a 4th of July fireworks event. A pop-up can be any time of year. It can be one day, a couple of hours. It could be an entire year. Bricks and More has found, um, we have created our own department on it. We've done in the past year, 2020, a year where things were um, pulling back and regression. We saw that people were adaptive, evolving. People want to experience the retail and did over 800 pop-ups in 2020 alone throughout our entire um portfolio with a team of six individuals. So it does take a lot of people to be able to create that much activity and momentum. Um, this is an interesting statistic for everyone out there. Over 8,000 stores are gonna be opened by a digital startup. That's amazing over the next four years. That just shows how things are evolving and moving. And we're constantly hearing from retailers who have been around for many years. And Barry said it best, he was, be on the first genesis of this pop-up initiative, trying to convert us as landlords saying, hey, let me try this temp leasing. And so um, for, for you, you gotta find what, what is right for your pop-up and what does that mean? So we're gonna talk you through uh, finding and qualifying your pop-up with your landlord and how you can use your resources in your community as well as um, your own network and your own tools. That's great. Um, the, the, there are many reasons to do a pop-up these days. Um, and um, this is a survey on uh, the percentages of people and what they do, why they do pop-ups. Um, you can read it, I'll read it real quickly. 51% they want to improve market visibility. 46% said they want to increase sales. 46% um, increase social media engagement. 35% because they better understanding from customers about brand, 22% to increase website traffic, 20% to lower overall costs compared with permanent long-term space, 18% um, better understanding of customer needs, 17% uh, generated sales to generate sales leads, and my favorite, 5% or other. And isn't it interesting that the generation of sales leads is, you know, one of the lowest compared to the market visibility, Barry, that really yeah. shows you that a pop-up is, um, you know, an expansive opportunity. Right. And the other thing is that I'll get into uh, in, 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 in the next slide is that, you know, most people think that the main reason to do a pop-up is to generate revenue. Mm -hmm. but the bottom line right. is you can see here, it's not. Um, yep. Pop-ups pop-up shops are more about marketing than they are about uh, doing revenue, immediate revenue. So anyway, um, here's our, our, our next uh, slide here. Um, one of the things when you're doing a pop-up and what, what we're trying to do here today is, is to give you some real quick little tricks of the trade, li li little tips on how you can have a really, really successful uh, pop-up. Uh, um, um, obviously, uh, Ron said, you know, it's not easy. Um, um, there's all kinds of decisions, but I, I think we can give you a little bit of a roadmap here, a little tricks of the trade so, so that you, you can be uh, really, really successful. Um, I will give you some examples as we go through a lot of examples of what we did at Sun and Ski Sports um, to uh, have very successful pop-up events. Um, the first thing, however, is before you even uh, look for a space, before you even think about marketing, before you even think about merchandising, the most important thing is you have to sit back and ask yourself, what is the objective of this pop-up? Because depending on what the objective is, it, it sets the stage for all kinds of other 
decisions. I mean, if you're going to have a big, massive sale, the pop-up would look a lot differently if you're going to have a fashion show. So you, you really need to sit back and say exactly what, what is my objective. And we've listed here a number of objectives for, for a pop-up. Um, as we talked about from the first slide, um, one reason is to generate sales. Uh, another one is to create buzz and brand awareness. Um, there's no greater way to uh, support your brand than to be eyeball to eyeball with the customer. And uh, a perfect example of that is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the brand, the internet glasses brand Warby Parker. Matter of fact, I'm wearing some Warby Parker right now. Hopefully they'll pay me for that. But Great, yeah. But it, uh, do you like them? You like them? Oh, I love them. Well, thank you. I, I, anyway, um, Warby Parker was, inter, is, was an internet only uh, retailer selling glasses online, $95 for a full frame and prescription. And um, they decided that they, um, they, they wanted some additional brand awareness. They wanted to create some buzz. And so they decided that uh, let's do some pop-ups. Let's go, let's meet our customers face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball, something that cannot be done on the internet. And uh, lo and behold, they did a number of them and they were so successful and so popular that they decided to add some inventory. And then the next thing you know, um, Warby Parker is now opening hundreds of their own stores uh, because of the success of those pop-up shops. So again, it's to create buzz, brand awareness, uh, uh, to connect with your customer. Uh, um, again, as, a, as an internet retailer, if you're pure internet, uh, um, it, it's difficult to have that relationship. And so I call it the fifth dimension. Um, um, it's a great way to meet your customer eyeball to eyeball. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other, another one is to test a, a new market. Uh, for, for example, um, because it's so inexpensive and the risk is so minimal, um, uh, I'll give you an example. One of the people that listen on our, our site is, is a vintage clothing company in Houston, Texas. And she has a very successful store very close to downtown. Uh, however, she was considering going to a suburb, a very affluent suburb in Houston called the Woodlands. But she wasn't quite sure if she would be successful there. So what she did was she did a pop-up in the Woodlands, found a great shopping center, um, through our site, as a matter of fact, did a really great deal for a weekend. I think it was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and had a pop-up event. She marketed through her own social media. The landlord, of Laura, will, talk, will tell you about help with their social media. And she had a wildly successful pop-up. So it told her that there definitely is a demand that, that this Woodlands Market would be a great uh, location for a second store. So, so, and what did it cost? It, it, she, she walked into a uh, um, second use retail uh, operation. It already had fixtures, okay? It already had clothing racks. It already had a counter. All she had to do is put a register. It already had dressing rooms. And, and, and so there was no build out. All she had to do was come in and add some of her own flavor. And for little risk at all, she learned a, a big, very uh, valuable um, lesson. Oh, I um, love hearing those success stories. They're I know, so I do, I do too, I do too. Um, and, and again, when you talk about pop-ups, the word test comes in a lot. Mm -hmm. Test, test, test. Uh, next one is test a location, just like she did. Uh, you can test pricing and merchandising ideas. Uh, um, that, that's a way that you can, that you can have a one-off locations where you can do your marketing research. Um, a, another objective is to move older inventory. And, and this is a big one. Um, you know, um, as a retailer, we, we discovered at Sun and Ski that you can't have too many sales. And the reason being is, as your retailers out there know, is that the more sales you have, you, you begin to train your customers that, um, hey, I, I need something here, but they have so many sales, I might as well just wait for a sale. And so here's a case where a retailer, and especially it's been prevalent because of COVID-19, lots of excess inventory and as retailers know you got to move the inventory you, you have to turn that inventory what a great way to liquidate excess inventory older inventory go someplace else uh, go some some to uh, some other market away from your store and have a, an opportunity to put your merchandise in and sell the merchandise 
And you're in that way, you're not competing with yourself by the same token, you're, you're doing some marketing uh, for your brand. Um, the next thing is um, customer acquisition. Um, a lot of people, for example, we have some um, um, pop-ups that are actually at the airport. They do pop-ups at the airport. Houston, Houston has a mm -hmm. section for pop-ups at the airport. And, and their main objective isn't necessarily to sell anything, but, but it, it's to either collect email addresses, which are very, very valuable, and or drive traffic to their website. So all these travelers coming in from all over the place have an interaction with their product category, say, man, this is good stuff. This is cool merchandise. And then of course the message is you can buy it 24 seven on our website and then give them information about the website. Um, uh, uh, another aspect, another reason why you may wanna do it is what I call total market coverage. Um, give you an example of Sun and Ski Sports. Uh, Sun and Ski uh, had five store, has five stores in the Houston area. Uh, however, reflecting back uh, and, and with the advent of pop-up shops, um, maybe the way to go and to really improve the prof profitability of the company was to maybe have two or three flagship stores, okay? And then supplement with pop-ups for various seasons. And there's a way then that you um, can um, increase your sales reduce your expenses because as you all know, it's very expensive to have a full line store uh, all year long. Uh, for, for the case of Sun and Ski, and I'll talk about it a little later, um, we were a very seasonal retailer. Uh, um, 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 people don't know this, but uh, the ski snow sports, even though we had a, a lot of Sunbelt stores, snow sports was the biggest part of our, our, our merchandise. And so um, when, when, when I did do the pop-ups, we, did a, we did, basically did a ski shop. Um, as opposed to having, making a lot of money and a lot of sales during the ski season and then having to sit uh, to, in slower times in the summer, we decided let's do ski shops for the ski season. And so that was something that really, really, really helped us, um, which moves us into our um, next category, which is seasonality. Probably the, um, the, the, the big, best example, I just told you about sun and ski in the ski season. The best example, as we all know, is the Halloween stores. Um, they've been doing they've been doing this for years. Why Forever. set up a Halloween store in January? That doesn't make sense. When you can uh, set up 45 days or 60 days before Halloween and then get and leave right after Halloween, you lock in all that traffic for holiday uh, for Halloween, and, and then obviously you don't have all the expenses of, of year round occupancy. Um, there's other things you can set up a pop up for Valentine's Day if let's say you're a jewelry store or Mother's Day. Um, <laughs> excuse me um so so uh, it really uh, um is is beautiful for these calendar events in houston for example the second the world's second largest rodeo is it comes to houston now unfortunately a lot of what i'm talking about now there's no uh, no rodeo because of covid but second largest rodeo comes to houston many retailers do pop-ups around the city if they have western wear western gear and what, you know, what, what a great way to take advantage of all that enthusiasm uh, uh, for, for the rodeo. But um, you know, Barry, I've actually seen a lot of these seasonal events have broken down. So instead of doing the rodeo, they may just do um, some of their like food vendors and a clothing vendor as it pops yeah. up. We're having that uh, for the past year, that's the way we've been activating our parking lot spaces with our normal events that comes they can't um aggregate the con the the community they're breaking it down to smaller pieces and still allowing people to have that excitement right. so you know it's continually evolving good point excellent point uh, another objective and another reason to have a pop-up is to educate your consumer uh for example at sun and ski we had uh, we would go have a pop-up temporary location in advance of a big bike ride uh, for example, in Houston, there is a major bike ride called the MS-150. It's in support of multiple sclerosis. It's a bike ride from Houston to Austin. It's huge, 11,000 riders. And so what we would do is we would go to different locations and have a bike class, how to ride a bike, what's courtesy on, on riding a bike, how to change a tire, um, all the various kinds of things, how to hydrate. So we actually had classes and we educated our consumer um, obviously for the purpose of them having a wonderful time and to give back to the community, uh, but also it obviously is great advertising uh, for, our, for our stores. Um, another 
uh, objective is to provide experiential and uh, experiential aspect to it. Um, experiential stuff is going on. The key word today, the new retail is experience. Um, so it's great for a pop-up. The pop-up could be a demonstration. Uh, we used to do something at Sun and Ski that I'm proud of, was I actually bought, now this costs a little money, but I bought a portable climbing wall that we could uh, trailer behind our, our, our company truck. And we would pop up at, at, at various events and festivals. And actually the portable climbing wall actually popped up. It That's really smart. Up, and, and we let all the kids climb for free. And again, it's, it's experiential. It speaks volumes about our brand. It, it is it is a great great uh, marketing. Last but not least, um, it's a the uh, there's an objective of sampling your product. There's many cases to do a pop up just for sampling, and um, I'll give you an, an example of how sampling works. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Mrs. Fields cookies. Um, they're in most every major mall in the country. Well, the history of Mrs. Fields is that she was a, a, a good cook and had people over for dinner and always served chocolate chip cookies as dessert. And time after time, her guests would say, oh my gosh, these are the best chocolate chip cookies I have ever had. They are so delicious. You ought to have a cookie store. And so after a number of people pushing her in that direction, in San Francisco, she did a pop-up, the first one, and had a little cookie store where she had her chocolate chip cookies. Well, lo and behold, she opens up and not one customer comes in. Um, so she is getting very discouraged and out of desperation. And because she had so much inventory anyway, she went out, went out on the sidewalk and start sampling her chocolate chip cookies. And, and people would take a bite and go, oh my gosh, where do I get these? They run in and they bought them. And like I say, the rest is history. So um, um, sampling is a, could be a big thing, and a pop up is just perfect uh, um, for for doing the, the the sampling. So or a sample sale. Or a samples and exactly a sample sale. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so again, the idea is what is the objective? Is it to show merchandise? Is it to sell? Is it to in entertain? Is it to educate? Is it to expose your product? Is it to test? Is it to collect data? Is it to sample? You, you have to sit back and say to yourself, what is my objective? And then once you determine that, then everything flows uh, logically. And we'll get into that as we progress. Yeah, very helpful to understand that. And so to hear from the landlord side, what our objective is, that really helps you as a brand and a retailer or a pop-up, this is your first time, or if you've tried it and never had the success that you were looking for, understand both sides. And the first most important thing is our success as a landlord is tied directly to your success. And so what does that mean? It means partnership. So whether it be partnership of um, helping you with your social media, but understanding that the landlord is looking for you to help us in many ways. We're able to create traffic to our shopping center, which helps the other retailers and tenants, whether it be the salon or the restaurants. Um, it's being local to the community and seeing what needs they have. So it may be a entrepreneur who uh, is really great at um, making candles and um, they want to have a charity and they work with the local high school or a wood shopping class, um, understanding what the community is requesting as a landlord. And that's something that at Bricksmore we take uh, very, very important to understand that for each individual shopping center. Um, it helps us market the center and market your pop-up or our retailers. So for us, you know, we want to see activity in the shopping center. We want to see customers in your stores and our other stores. Uh, we want to help bring events and activate our shopping center. I think one of the things, and you see this along the bottom of the slide here, it's important again to say, as Barry was just pointing out, success is not always calculated by the sales within your brick and mortar. Same thing for a landlord. Um, we wanna see you open and thriving and we need to understand what your needs are. So by having that balance of the partnership, we can both work hand in hand in our objectives. That's great. Um, of course, with um, any venture, there's um, um, hurdles and struggles. 
there's obviously hurdles and struggles for the pop-up and there's also hurdles and struggles for the landlord. I'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> the hurdles and struggles for the pop-up. Um, and, and, and by the way, um, I would be remiss if I didn't indicate that our little new company, popupshops.io, helps overcome many of these hurdles. Uh, the first one, obviously, if you're gonna do a pop-up, the first thing you need to do is after uh, determining what your objective is, is you gotta find a location. Um, you got to you, you, you need to staff it. You need to understand benchmarks. Uh, and, and as Laura was saying, it, is sales, maybe sales isn't a benchmark, uh, um, but maybe numbers of emails collected um, is, is a benchmark uh, or, or maybe tra traffic count is a, is a benchmark. And so you need to de determine uh, um, what is the benchmark? What, what does success look like? Uh, um, then you have to learn the market. Um, you need to know what your demographics are, and then you have to match your demographics with the demographics of the center. And, and it's not only demographics, uh, which is age and income, um, but it's psychographics, which is lifestyle. And, 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 and again, uh, on popupshops.io, we have a services section. Um, first of all, you, you can determine all the demographics um, um, of the shopping center if the, if the landlord chooses to post it on their listing. Um, and um, th there's all kinds of ways that you can get really good information on our site. Uh, uh, marketing from social media to advertising is, is really, really important. Uh, obviously, uh, um, you need to know how to market. And um, we have a, a section of our site, which we call services, that has all kinds of independent third parties that can help you overcome many of these things. For example, if, if you want to do market on, marketing on your own, that's fine. If you're looking for a consultant on marketing, we have them on our site. If you're looking for an, uh, an advertising agency, we have those on our site. Um, uh, oftentimes when you do a pop-up, the landlord will say you need to have insurance, you need to have liability insurance, it's a requirement. Well, as a new um, pop up, you you probably don't know where to get liability insurance as it relates to retail. Again, you uh, um, uh, um, these are all the kinds of hurdles that you have to figure out. There may be legal, there may be accounting, you may have to find fixtures, you may have to find signage. Um, but again, um, many of these problems can be solved uh, on the services section of popupshops.io. That's definitely the biggest hurdle I know from working with so many pop ups is that understanding. Uh, the certificate of insurance, where to turn, where to look. Once you find that location, there's so many locations, you know, how is it right for you? You can really ask your landlord um, for additional information that's maybe beyond just what you see. No, but a lot of times you're choosing a location because it's in your community or you are a retailer and you have a store nearby. So logistically, it makes sense to be two miles away. You can utilize some of your management or have um, your customers draw from store to store. But um, for a landlord, you know, again, we have hurdles and struggles that we work together with you. And a lot of times you might love one of our shopping centers and we just don't have the vacancy at the right time or we need to have new HVAC equipment. But ask these questions to your landlord and ask them, you know, hey, are you willing to throw a fresh coat of paint on the wall um, or how about parking? You know, can I get a dedicated parking spot because we're doing a lot of pickup orders? And I think landlords are very open with communication to understand what your issues are. And then we can also share from our perspective how we can or can't do something. Um, we have lease restrictions, which you may not be aware of. So if we have a anchor in our shopping center, which is, you know, if you think of TJ Maxx or Target, they're going to have specific lease rights that prohibit us from doing certain things. So we have to look at that before we can get to that, you know, finding the location uh, within our portfolio for you and balance our tenant mix. We can't fill the shopping center with the same type of use. So if we have a pizza shop, we love to have a nail salon and a boutique and um, so on and so forth. Um, but you should ask us, you know, which property is right for you. Also ask your landlord, you know, make sure you're walking through that space and that vacancy and ask for photos or, you know, we have on our website, it's phenomenal. We have an ID plan which shows everything. It's a 3D virtual tour, it's photos, it's um, dimensions. It shows you if there's still fixtures in the space as Barry said. 
Um, a her this herd last hurdle is really the, the license agreement is something that we've simplified to make it a less legal lease and more understanding for the first time pop up an entrepreneur that when they read it, the um, terms are basic and it's very short. Um, but, you know, I would recommend hiring an attorney just to read through so you understand what you're signing. Um, and then lastly, the signage, you know, you see over here in our picture, it has a cute little pop up shop. Make sure you get signage out there. And a lot of times the municipality may not permit a banner. So get creative with heat banners or standees, um, but work with your landlord to understand what you can and cannot have because signage is key to the success just so people know you're there. So Barry and I, you know, Barry, we were going to do a poll, but maybe it's best if we ask um, Alyssa or Janelle to do the poll for us since they have that polling feature because I can't see the screen. Can you see if we ask people to write in like we were saying earlier? No. Yeah. So um, maybe we'll hold till the end then on our poll. What do you think? Okay. Yeah, that would be good. That would be okay. Good. All right. So um, just to go into a little bit more detail on the locations, you know, there's various places that uh, you could open your pop-up shop. It's not just the standard of a mall or a shopping center like Bricksmore. There's um, more unique opportunities and growing opportunities. There's mobile trucks, there's shipping containers. You'll see the T-Mobile that is a truck that they open and close and drive and they go from our property to property. Um, the upper right is actually a wine bar in a shipping container and, and it is semi-permanent, but it just shows you that there's so many opportunities and the store within a store concept, the co-op, uh, you'll hear from one of Barry's uh, clients who operates that way. And it's great because she brings in all these unique, eclectic uh, artists and entrepreneurs and brands into one space and is responsible for that lease on her temporary space. But these are opportunities that, you know, the small artists would not be able to utilize a full store for. So it brings yeah. people together. We, we call those collectives. Right, collectives, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, when selecting your location, you know, you really need to understand the amenities. So if you're a second generation um, boutique, do we have a former boutique? So you can plug and play or a salon, restaurants. You, we've seen a lot of food trucks that are, we love this, graduating from the food truck to the restaurant or actually vice versa too. Um, understanding if there's dressing rooms, um, again, the signage opportunities that are within the shopping center, whether it be on the windows or the pylon, there's their digital signage. It all goes into selecting your location and helping that location pop out. Um, and also finding the location, you can use matching services. One of our favorites, popupshops.io. But there's many other ones out there that you can use, LoopNet. Um, we also find that our Chamber of Commerce connects many different retailers to us as a landlord. So you can go to your own community. There may be an entrepreneur page. Um, there may be a business district, but definitely getting out there and um, just even simply Googling retail space available within your community and you can find who's out there. Um, the, the next topic is how to make your brand and merchandise pop. It, it's that merchandising strategy I know Ron in the first presentation was talking about how fun it is to merchandise using your own creativity, uh, trying to make that space your own. And um, uh, we have um, a lot of experience in doing this. And again, um, you could, if you're gonna do a pop-up, um, you gotta determine what your budget is, okay? Um, for example, uh, Kylie Jenner did a pop-up did a pop-up tour, um, but but just for the uh, the first pop-up, I think it was in Los Angeles. She spent close to seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I'm sure that Kylie's probably not on this uh, webinar today, 
Um, and if you don't have $750,000 to spend, um, we have some little tricks of the trade, little things that you can do to have um, a stellar, creative, fun environment without spending a lot of money. Oh, that's one of our favorite stats, Barry, that we normally share. Your average pop-up only spends $5,000. Yeah, so and in some cases, right, right. And in some cases, it's even less. In some mm -hmm. cases, it's even less. Um, the, but the, the first thing you want to know is that um, why is merchandising important? Because um, it gives a first impression. And um, many people don't know this, but it has been proven that a consumer within the first five to 10 seconds of walking into a retail store will make the decision whether they're gonna buy there or not. And so that sort of speaks volumes. Um, um, it, you need to have a good first impression uh, related to what you're trying to do. Again, remember, what is your objective? Okay, that's the, that's the key question here. Um, and then your design has to relate to that objective, has to be the aura of you. For, for example, if you have a, a, a high-end, beautiful woman's fashion boutique, um, your fixturing and, and the look and feel of that store would be a lot different. And if your um, objective was to do a um, um, aged inventory, liquidation, obviously the fixturing and so forth would look a lot different than, than it would if you're trying to do a boutique. And then again, talking about money, there are, are different ways. If you're doing a boutique, let's say, um, there's you can do some tables, um, you, you can um, get uh, things at, at uh, the secondhand stores, at antique shops, uh, sometimes great looking tables, you can find amours, um, you can put rugs down over rugs, you can put some pictures on the wall, uh, um, little touches that you can do within a space to make it your own and, 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 and make it very, very effective. One little trick we found at Sun and Ski was, um, since we're outdoorsy kind of store, we, we always like natural wood, we like barn wood. Okay, so how can you find barn wood? And if you do find barn wood, it's really, really expensive. Well, we figured out if you go to a, a fence company, a company that puts fences puts up fences in people's backyard. Uh, um, um, what, what they do, what their deal is, they'll come to the homeowner, they will put in a new fence and they'll take out the old fence. And then they bring the old fence back to their headquarters. And so we would walk into some of these fence companies and there'd just be tons and tons of old distressed wood fences. And, and not only do we not have to pay for them, they encouraged us to take them because they didn't know what to do with them. Great. So then we were then we were able to sort of chop them up a little bit. We could make pictures out of them. We could put them on the sides of tables. We could put them on the sides of fixtures. And so here is a case where we got a little creative, cost us hardly anything, and had some really cool looks. So again, use your imagination. Um, you don't have to spend a lot of money. In many cases, as I've mentioned and Laura's mentioned. Uh, the pop-up that you can do is a second use space. It may have fixtures in there already. You know, Sun and Ski did a did, did a pop-up for the holidays one, one season where it was a it was a former shoe store that went out of business. And and the flat wall was there, all the fixtures were there, even even the cash wrap counter was there. And so all Sun and Ski had to do, all we had to do is just move in merchandise. So so um the, the pop-up really gives you some opportunities here. The, the other thing um, we, we, we talked about, and Laura's mentioned, is you tap into senses. I know Ron mentioned that as well. Um, sound is important. Um, it's very important, though, that you, if, if you're playing music, that you play music that is uh, uh, towards your customer. Um, smell is important. And I might add this. Um, um, sometimes when you do find a pop-up that is a second-use space that has been vacant, uh, oftentimes you walk in and find that there may be a little bit of a musty smell. Well, that's no big deal. Um, you can get these aerators and put them in the, in, 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 plug them in, but it's really, really important because it, believe it or not, um, the uh, smell uh, drives traffic. I mean, it, it drives sales. Uh, tasting is another thing we talked about, um, um, you know, the, the sampling, but also many cases um, you can have some food, beverage, drinks, that's always great. 
um, at, at Sun and Ski in, in the height of the holiday season. We would serve on a Saturday afternoon in the ski season. We'd serve wine and cheese in the store. Um, 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 so that's all, all good. Uh, also, um, sometimes you want to, again, you're talking about the senses tap into that experiential aspect. Um, oftentimes you can, uh, if you have a fashion approach, if you uh, if it's high fashion, you may want to do a fashion show. Um, but there's all kinds of things that you can do to, like I say, to tap into those uh, um, senses, which are really, really important. Um, you also want to make sure it's easy to shop, it's convenience, and that there's assistance, that you have sales help there. Um, uh, you know, this is a tricky subject, but um, a lot of times we found that pop-ups would have an apparel offering, and then they'd forget to have dressing rooms in the store. Um, so dressing rooms are important. Now, again, that's controversial now because of COVID-19. So it's up to the individual um, 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 pop-up uh, whether you want to have dressing rooms or not, but um, that, they, they certainly help. Um, there's also simple details uh, um, on, on the, the fixtures. Uh, um, for example, um, if you're going to do a pop-up, there are many people that not only do one pop-up, but they've been so successful in doing a pop-up that they'll do a regular pop-ups throughout the year. In that case, you can go to um, some of the fixture supply houses and you can get for inexpensively portable fixtures. Many of the fixture supply houses, and matter of fact, we have them listed under our services section of our site, um, have actually gone after the pop-up business and have designed fixtures that are made for pop-ups, meaning that they are portable, they break down easy and, and can be uh, transported very, very easy. Um, another aspect that's really, really important is lighting. Um, um, lighting sells merchandise. And uh, I can tell you an example at Sun and Ski uh, um, where we go into a store and see a, a, a rack of merchandise in the corner of the store where there was no light, um, where it was dingy. And uh, then we would go back to the numbers and look at the data and almost invariably where the light was dingy, when there was less light, um, the merchandise in that square footage was not selling as well as where the lighting was better. And so the proof was we would take that merchandise and we would move it in an area where the light was better or we would improve the lighting in that particular area. And more times than not, that merchandise, the sales absolutely popped. Um, so again, you don't want to put lighting in a store. You, you're a pop-up. You don't have the budget to put, unless you're, you know, Kylie Jenner, you don't have the the budget to put lighting, but you can do some um, 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 some spotlights. You can do some lamps. Uh, there, there's certain little things that you can do that aren't expensive that do illuminate the merchandise. And then, of course, you want the store to be clean, and 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 you, you want it to be well stocked. Um, and then let's talk about signage, which is the next item. Uh, Laura mentioned signage. Um, um, it's signage is critical. Signage is really important, both in store and out, outside the store. Um, uh, there's many cases where um, there was a, a pop-up um, that was beautiful. I mean, it was executed to the tens. Uh, you walk inside and it felt good. There was tons of merchandise. They had great staff. Uh, there was great music. Um, everything was working. The problem was that there was no signage outside the door. All the customers, all the traffic were just walking right by this, be this beautiful uh, pop-up. And so the idea is you got to let people know you're there. And so as Laura was pointing out, you got to put signs in the window. And, and even if the, if the landlord will, will let you, of course, Laura is very liberal on this, I hope, um, you, you can do the A-frame signs in front of the store. Um, I, I don't know about that, Laura. Can we I, will, that? I will say, counter to what we're saying right now, I do think this is an interesting tidbit to share. I have a pop-up operator that I work with, and he goes nationally throughout the portfolio, and he stays for 10 days, and there was one municipality, it's a historic area, doesn't allow signage unless it's permanent. He used, and this we'll, we'll get to, Barry, we probably are in like a three-minute warning, so we can allow time for um, questions, uh -oh. but... Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Um, I want to share this. He could not put signage up. He had a small sign in the window. He used Facebook and Google marketing and had his best sale ever. So mm -hmm. I think it just shows, you know, you can be very creative with where you spend your dollars and you don't want to spend 
as a pop-up, you know, $5,000 historic sign that you're going to pull down after your sale for 10 days, but, you know, put 1200 into Facebook and um, text marketing, geocoding, and um, it, it really drives the sales. Right. Um, but, but again, to, and also to your point, there is inherent traffic in the center and you want to let those people, those people know that you're there. So mm -hmm. like I say, signage is important. If you can go out on the sidewalk, that's even better. Um, the last thing about merchandising is that um, pop-ups are temporary, okay? And so it's okay to have that FOMO factor, fear of missing out. It's okay if a pop-up looks like a pop-up. It doesn't necessarily, uh, the expectation isn't that, that it's just gorgeous, uh, a full line store. Um, it can look like it's temporary, it can look like a, uh, um, that it's here today and, and that it's only here on a limited basis so that it increases that urge to buy. And Absolutely. so there's just a few little tricks on, on pop-up. Uh, next uh, uh, is making your people pop. Um, this is one of the biggest uh, uh, challenges that people have is staffing. Um, and, and then basically, but it, it's really not, a, when you dig into it, um, there are some tricks, there are some tricks that you can, that you can accomplish here. Uh, the first question is, is who do you hire? Uh, um, um, and, and the thing is you want people who, you, we, we used to have a slogan at Sun and Ski, hire the smile. Uh, you want people that are friendly. You want people that are well-spoken. You want people that look the part. And, and when you say hire the smile, just somebody with a nice smile, positive attitude speaks volumes and how they'll inter interact. Uh, uh, attitude is everything. Uh, um, if you can find evangelists for your brand, people that know your story, um, and most important, they need to be a reflection of your brand, a reflection of what you're merchandising. I'll give you a quick example of Sun and Ski. We had one store that was not doing very well in swimwear at all. Uh, all the other stores were booming in women's high fashion, expensive swimwear. And this one store was at, at the bottom of the pack. So I personally went to visit the store to figure out what's going on. And what I discovered was that the staff of the store was all teenage boys. And here these teenage boys are trying to sell high fashion, gorgeous swimwear to these high fashion women. Obviously it didn't work. What we did was we rearranged the staffing. We added uh, women to our staff and the, the sales exploded. Um, dress code is really important. Grooming is very important. And uh, um, last but not least, I like incentives. If you have a staff there and you, you're going for sales, then if you have a sales plan and you meet the sales plan, everybody gets something. Mm -hmm. And it may, be not, it may not be sales, it may be emails collected, or it may be people talked to, but there should always be some kind of a incentive for, a, a, for success. So um, uh, one, one last thing here is, is the training. Um, it, it's fairly easy to train. Um, you got a, a real quick uh, time period here. Um, 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 and I can tell you that little uh, topics speak volumes. For example, I'm stealing something from Nordstrom's. Nordstrom's training program for many years, the, the entire sales training program was one sentence. And that sentence was, treat your customers like you would want to be treated. Again, treat your customers like you would want to be treated. Um, and, and, and again, that speaks volumes. And so you, you talk to people, you pick people about that. You tell your story, you let them know what distinguishes you. You give them a little product knowledge. Um, give them some basic sales steps and maybe do some role playing. Um, we had a program at Sun and Ski called CARE. It was an acronym that helped people in the steps of selling. CARE uh, stood for C. First of all, it's CARE because we cared, but C was connect. So you connect with the customer. A was assess their needs. R was recommend and for their needs. And E was encourage. So, so there's little tricks, like I say, that you can do uh, from finding people to training people to have a successful pop-up. I love that. That that can be applied in so many aspects. <clears throat> so last, guys, we just want to go over making your marketing pop. Um, this is one that's often forgotten. And don't uh, discount this because this is how you're getting your uh, pop-up out there. I heard Ron was asked this question, you know, when do you start? You don't want to start too soon. You know, Halloween, people know Halloween's coming. They know about holiday. But if you're going to have a pop-up in June, you want to start marketing that 30 to 60 days out. Just like Ron said, create that attention and the awareness and attraction. Um, connect with your landlord's social media. We often post our uh, pop-up and our grand openings on our permanent stores. 
Um, you can have launch parties. You can invite, uh, you know, local community clubs and organizations to drive up the traffic and the awareness. Utilize cross marketing. It's basically free. Offer a coupon or an incentive to um, bring people into the store. Um, you can use influencers um, and grabbing those email. You know, I know I'm one who still loves a good email to get me into the store. Now you've heard a lot from us. We thought that it would be really exciting to hear from someone who actually popped up within Bricksmore's portfolio and why a pop-up was successful for them and um, why you should work with us. Um, yeah, so um, we were we spoke with Bricksmore and we pretty much got everything done within 48 hours. Um, it was a really fast turnaround. He came into our South Street location, saw the vision, spoke with Brittany, um, the owner, and um, we was like, yes, we have to do this. The Rosewood Mall is a great location. And it's funny because we were trying to figure out where to go. And y'all came in, Bricksmore came in right away and said, hey, we got the perfect location for you. We're at the Rosewood Mall. We're happy. We're excited. Um, the, the outcry for this location is perfect because a lot of people had to travel from this location all the way down to South Street. So this really cut that travel for them in half. So it, it, was, it, was, it was the best thing we could do. It's just a great example to show that we're listening to the community and bringing them into our center. Um, you heard Willie say in 48 hours, we talked to the shop owner to signing the license agreement and getting them open within our shopping center in Philadelphia. It's all about speed and helping that shop owner get what she needed to get the new location. And this is um, an example of a success story um, that Barry works with um, at the Houston Galleria, right, Barry? Oh, right, Houston Galleria, correct. Great. As a pop-up shop brand myself, it is very important for me to be able to understand what the landlord needs and what they're trying to get out of it so that we can be successful together. Making sure that we both fully understand what's in our contract, what uh, the demographics are, and how we want to work together to make that happen is very important for us. Also, making sure that we have a very good plan of how we're going to do marketing and fixturing and what are all the things that we need as a brand to be wildly successful and at the same time also help our landlords be successful. Oh, I love everything she just said. It's, it was basically our whole presentation wrapped up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to um, flip over to our chat now. So I hope everyone can uh, see us again. Barry, I see you. Hello, everyone. And do we have any questions? I'm sorry we didn't leave too much time, but uh, is there anything we can answer? Sorry, did anyone get the CARE acronym? That was Kim. Oh, okay. CARE means connect. So you connect with the you connect with the customer. A is assess, assess their needs. R is recommend based on their needs, and E is encourage them to buy. And, and, and if you, it's just a real simple formula that that spells again speaks volumes on how you sell merchandise. And I love Ron echoed what we said. Creativity doesn't have to be expensive. It really doesn't, guys. Um, it's it's using the resources that you have available. Um, I hope that you connect with me on LinkedIn. Find me on bricksmore.com. If you're looking for a location, you know, one of the things that I love about our especially leasing community is that if I don't have an opportunity, I'm gonna pass you along to someone else. I'm gonna tell you about Barry's platform. Um, I love everything that he can offer. It really helps me as um, a landlord answering all the questions, having his service features. So definitely please check and, out. And, and I will say this is a love fest. I will say that Bricksmore is a phenomenal landlord. So make sure you check out all their spaces as well. You can get a hold of me at uh, Barry at popupshops.io. Popupshops.io. Um, Barry, a question came in. Can you repeat where to get the portable fixtures you mentioned? Can they go to popupshops.io? Well, um, you, where you get them is at um, fixture supply houses, okay? And we have a couple of fixture supply houses on our site in the services section. 
Um, if, if you know somebody, usually every city has a fixture house. And uh, like I say, pop-ups are so, uh, so popular now that many of these supply houses have specific fixtures for pop-ups that you can tear down and break down and then set up and it looks, it looks great. Also, if we got two minutes left. One thing I forgot when I was talking about people is where you find the people. Okay, I told them about how you train them. I told them what to look for. And where you find people as employees, obviously, that's number one. Friends, uh, you have many friends who love what you're doing, who know your story. They could be great people. Customers, uh, we, we at Sun and Ski would have a big sale and we would have some customers to work on those Saturdays. Be honest with you, some of them were so good that they became full-time salespeople for us. And then another area is vendors. If you, are, uh, if you sell products from other companies like Nike or Brooks or, or whatever, they will, bring, they will have their sales rep come in and help you on your pop-up. Uh, and then if worse comes to worse, you can go to staffing companies and modeling agencies. And again, we have a couple of those staffing agencies on our site as well. And it looks like Janelle already posted one of the polls. We were gonna ask Barry, what type of retailer are you? So um, Janelle, we were very interested in hearing if there was who made up the audience, retailers, brands, landlords. So if you could post a poll similar to that, we'd love to hear um, oh, and you have, have you opened a pop-up before? So these were all the questions Barry and I were gonna ask. Uh, we're used to doing a live audience interaction. Yeah, yeah. Everyone found the information and the you create your own recipe to find your success. Right. Thank you all. We really appreciate your listening. And thank you, Janelle, for putting on this spectacular pop-up summit. Thank you.